Thanks, everybody. It's, uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, jQuery is one of my favorite frameworks for uh, prototyping things, and, uh, and I'm really excited to have an opportunity to talk to you. So um, first, I'll give you an introduction, who I am. Um, my business card actually does say API Ninja on it. That is my, my official job title. Um, what does that mean? That means I go around and I, uh, well, Three Scale, where I work, is an API management company. We have a lot of customers who are trying to make APIs for people. So one of the things I do is I go around and I teach people how to make APIs that don't make developers cry. But I haven't had a chance to talk to all of the API developers, so I also go around and I talk to developers about how to use APIs without crying. So um, that's kind of what I'm going to do here. Um, we, there's, a, there's a huge range of APIs out there, and they have various levels of um, stability and accuracy. And one of the things that's most frustrating as a developer is running into problems and not knowing how to resolve them or understand what's going wrong. So I'm going to try to help you get a better understanding sort of how the whole stack works. I know that some of you in this room are probably quite familiar with um, HTTP APIs or REST APIs. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to provide for you, which is really valuable, is you probably have people where you work who aren't as familiar with REST APIs. So I'm going to try to give you some language that you can use to help them understand what an API is, how it works, why it's important, and you know why it causes more vulnerability because you're relying on somebody else's service. So. I, I was in the API team at Netflix. Um, I was in the API team at LinkedIn, and now m most of my job is is, uh, is developer education, trying to, to help us all come up with good best practices and um, on the producer and consumer end. Uh, I am a language polyglot. I I would say JavaScript is probably my fifth best language, but, um, but I love all languages. Really what I want to do is I want to help people get past things that frustrate them and help them reach success and create awesome things. So this talk, I'm going to give you a quick overview of HTTP. It'll be pretty basic for some of you and some of you. As it turns out, what I discovered when I was helping do API support for developers is that um, there are a lot of really fantastic developers who are amazingly great at Java or other compiled languages and haven't had a lot of exposure to how web things work together. And so they, they'd say, I installed this library and I asked for a profile and I didn't get anything back. What's up? And I said, hey, so what did the HTTP traffic look like? What were the headers? And they're like, I, what? The, the what? The, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So, it occurred to me that it, you know, making the assumption that everybody has the same framework, has been working with the web since 93, and, and is totally up on you know, what we're building on, uh, isn't fair, and it's, and it's not reasonable. So I'm going to kind of build that picture for you. So again, if you don't understand how it works already, you'll understand it better. And if you do understand how it works, you'll be able to describe it to other people so that they can let you get your work done. Uh, so, and then I'll finish up with some debugging tips and techniques, how you can, how you can get the API to tell you why it's not working when it's not doing what you want it to do. So if you want to play along, um, I'm going to be showing how you can trace HTTP traffic and what that means, what the pieces of the HTTP traffic are. Um, HTTP scoop is my favorite sniffer, although they, uh, they didn't. They, they they were having some problems recently. So if you can't find them, uh, you can use Wireshark, which is uh, not listed here because it is the ugliest ever uh, UI. But it actually is one of the best sniffers. It, it's just really. It, it can be really uh, intimidating because it shows you a lot more stuff than you need. But um, Wireshark is there. If you have a PC, Fiddler is a fantastic tool to use, and it'll it'll it actually uh, also watches SSL traffic. Um, so uh, if you want to sort of play around with it while I'm talking, totally cool with that. I do that all the time in talks, too, so, <laughs> so I won't be insulted. Um, so let's get started and talk about what does an API need to be complete. Um, you may have heard people talk about CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. Those are really the four things that any API system needs to have in order to be reasonably useful. And one of the fantastic things about HTTP is that it sort of has all that stuff incorporated in it, even though it's only a communication protocol. 
And so it was easy to layer on top of that and make REST APIs, or as some people are now calling them, HTTP APIs, uh, to get away from the Roy, Roy Fielding um, uh, religion discussions that people tend to get caught up in. So HTTP, it's the hypertext transfer protocol. It's the language, uh, the protocol that your browser uses to talk to web servers. Um, it, as I said, it supports verbs for the CRUD operations, so get, put, post, and delete. And it also supports um, query parameters so that you can add more information to the request um, after defining which exact resource it is that you wanted to use. And you can mess with the headers as well to give a little bit more context. So we're going to go off into one of my story things where I describe, uh, so this is my Starbucks iced tea. I order it every day. Um, it's the same all the time. It's a trend of black iced tea, extra ice. Um, so let's, when you're trying to describe to people what APIs are, a lot of times they don't understand what a resource is. It's very meaningful to people who are programmers, not so meaningful for people who haven't worked with them before. So a resource ID is just a name. It's a name for a thing. So it's iced tea. HTTP verbs. So I'd like to order an iced tea. That's, that's a post. I've created a new order. Um, can you read my order back to me? Because that's a get. Um, actually, I want to change it, make it larger and unsweetened. Or, uh, crap, I left my, my wallet at home and I don't even have my iPhone, so forget it. I'm just going to cancel the order. So those are the four kinds of, of, of pieces that you need to be able to have to have a full conversation, a full API conversation. It's no different than a conversation that you have at any, with any cashier anywhere. Um, so parameters allow you to define specific things about it. Sometimes it can be filters. Sometimes it can just be extra ice or unsweetened. And then in the headers, we usually put context. So think of this as context. It's for here to go. Um, your browser will use headers to describe what kind of content it wants to get back, or what language you prefer to speak, or how to encode the responses to you. So headers are kind of pieces of information that describe how you'd like the whole conversation to go. Oh, also, I wanted to tell you there's chocolate up here. So <laughs> if you ask questions, um, you are welcome to come and get a chocolate. I would try to throw it to you, but this is a little further than I can throw, and I don't think that's going to work out for any of us. So, um, but I, I like to feed people chocolate, especially when I get the, the uh, much vaunted three o'clock slot where everyone's trying to fall asleep from, from lunch. So, HTTP works as follows it's very simple. Um, the client sends a request, it's going to have a method. Again, those are the verbs that we were talking about, get, put, post, delete. Um, the URL is the name, it's the resource, that is the unique identifier for the thing that you want. It's going to put those context things in headers, it's going to put options in parameters, and then it could send a body. So obviously if you're just saying, what, yeah, you, what, what does the iced tea look like, you're not going to send any content because you're just asking for a description, a get doesn't have any body. But if you're posting, if you're adding uh, an order or changing it, then there will be a body where you put that information. Um, this will all make more sense when I kind of show you what the HTTP scoop thing looks like. You can see this information as it goes back and forth. And then the server re replies, it's going to send you back content, unless you delete it, in which case there's no content to be uh, sent back. Status code, which I'll go over in a minute. And then it'll also send back headers with information for the client to use about how to process the information it sent back. Okay, so I, I, at OSCON, <laughs> I read this the way it should be read, and I got scolded. So um, this is the HTTP response code for dummies. 5XX is, uh, we messed up. Our server, our, our server just barfed, and, and we got nothing for you. Um, that actually can be useful for you even, you know, even if it's the server's fault, if you simplify the request, you may be able to find a way to get it to not barf, but you're not going to get a lot of useful information. It just, the server's like, I have no idea. Um, 40X or 4XX, because there can be 412s 
I'm teapot, or um, any other kind of response. It, that, that's, you messed up, that resource isn't there, or you're not allowed to see it, or you're not allowed to do that operation on it. Usually you will get some useful contextual information from the server about how you messed up, uh, like invalid signature or missing parameter or something else. Sometimes it'll just say, you know, four, 10, sorry. But again, this helps you to figure out how to get around this problem. Uh, 30x, ask that dude over there. I don't have this thing. Um, and 20x is cool. Any, uh, I made it, or you got it, or we're good. Nothing, no, nothing to worry about. Um, this is a very, I'm going to go over these really quickly because you can't really see the information. But it basically shows, even if all you're doing is browsing, you're sending, you got the, the method, again, get, um, the URL, the name, and then all these headers your, your browser will send to tell Google what it is that you want back. And Google sends back a response. It says, here's some information about it. This is how big the, the response is, uh, so you know when you get to the end. Uh, I've, con I've encoded it this way. So this is just to give you an idea. Even in simple web traffic, there's a lot of information that gets passed back and forth. So HTTP scoop. Um, a very simple request. What's nice about this is, so you saw the two slides before, they're kind of huge and, and the stuff isn't really organized in a way that's easy to understand. So HTTP scoop, Fiddler, even Wireshark is gonna do a better job of organizing that information in a way that's useful for you. So we have the URL, we have um, the, the, the status that we got back, um, content type, and you can see here the headers that you get. It's got both the request and the response headers, so you can see what, what you sent and what they sent. Um, one of the reasons this is so useful, I'll kind of give you an idea about the troubleshooting uses of HTTP scoop. A lot of times you can find somebody else's code that works for something similar, and your thing is not working. Well. HTTP APIs, REST APIs, they don't actually care who you are or, or you know, where you're coming from. They're almost always going to be concerned about how the request is formatted, um, how, how things are encoded. So a lot of times it's just binary testing. You have this working call and you have this not working call and you try to make the not working call look like the working call until you figure out which piece of it is confusing it. Using a tool that allows you to see what those headers are, what their parameters are, how they're sent, allows you to actually see where that difference is so that you can fix the problem. And then this is just showing the, the body. So REST APIs, again, we have a lot of people calling them HTTP APIs now, so if that's what you hear, that's what that means. Um, they leverage HTTP. They take advantage of the fact that HTTP is a protocol that looks very much like an API protocol already. Um, it can take advantage of the verbs. It can use the error codes. Um, there are a lot of HTTP status codes um, that can be used to communicate a lot of information back to the, to the clients. Or, you know, you can just stick with the very simple ones, but still, it's built in. Parameters and, uh, and headers allows you to add context to that. So this is one of the reasons that HTTP APIs have become so popular is because it's very simple. There's la in every language, including JavaScript, obviously, but any other language you work in, there's going to be a working HTTP library that's tested that works. So you know that that piece, that the, the part where your client is talking to the server, is going to function correctly, and you can focus on the, the content that's being passed back and forth. I'll give you a quick example REST request. Um, most REST APIs will require some sort of authentication. Uh, a few of them have a few calls that can be done, uh, Twitter and Tumblr. Uh, you can get the public feeds without, with just having a key. You don't have to go through the whole authentication process. I'll talk a little bit about how authentication works. Um, 
you can't really see it up there, but my Twitter handle is at Sinedra, S-Y-N-E-D-R-A. Um, if you have questions about anything, including uh, or especially authentication, I am happy to answer those questions offline, um, so you don't have to ask them here. Um, but m basically, the, the authentication information is going to be passed as a parameter or part of the header as context for the conversation that you're having with the server. But Tumblr allows you to grab stuff with just the API key. So now I'm making a functional request. We've got the name. You can see, you may be able to see, but my, my API key is the only parameter I'm sending there. Um, I'm not sending very many headers. I'm getting a few back. Very simple. And it just looks like this. It's a JSON. Super simple. Um, most REST APIs do use uh, J you do use JSON. Um, we still have some people who use XML. It does a better job with attributes on the pieces of information, uh, but JSON is tidier. It's easier for me to read, um, and uh, it tends to work well for REST HTTPs. Again, for authentication, OAuth is the industry standard. Um, here's where I'm going to start telling you something that I'm going to repeat a few times, which is use existing libraries for authentication or for anything else that you can. Um, you may think, this is great. I see the OAuth spec. I can write my own library. It will work great. Um, it probably won't. Um, and, and you probably have better things to do with your time than try to rewrite an OAuth library. Um, there are a lot of very fussy pieces. Uh, if, if the same parameter shows up more than once, uh, then they have to be alphabetized by the value, and uh, anyways, use existing libraries. Um, this is not a great place to reinvent the wheel, and there's great libraries out there for this. Um, and as I said, it's either passed in the headers, which is, which is easier in the long run, or parameters, which is, which is easier for prototyping. A lot of uh, vendors allow you to do either one. Um, I tend to use parameters for prototyping and then Try to get into the header if I can. Okay, so troubleshooting API calls. You've started working with an API and it's not doing what you want it to do and you're frustrated. So the first thing is HTTP scoop or Fiddler or Wireshark to understand what's happening in your calls. Find a call, and it doesn't even need to be in the same language. The server doesn't care what created the call. So maybe you go find a PHP library that makes the call that you want to make, and you use HTTP scoop and you watch that traffic. You look at the content, you look at the headers, you look at the parameters and see how they're being sent. You compare them until you get it as close as you possibly can. You'll find where the problem is. This transparency is one of the things that's amazing about HTTP APIs. It, historically speaking, we used to have libraries, we'd install them, and then they would be like a black box. We'd have no way to tell what was going wrong. But you have the power to do this. You don't have to wait for someone else to, to solve your problem, and you can get past it. Um, a lot of times, you put a, uh, a, an apostrophe in there, and it's not encoded correctly, or there's some foreign character, you're using UTF-8. So make a simpler request. Try to figure out how, where, where is it breaking? Um, there are tools such as RunScope, which allows you to interact with an API using uh, a web tool, which is fantastic. John Chien did a great job on that. Um, a lot of APIs actually have a console or IO docs, which are sim similar. They're explorers, so you can see what the request looks like, the content and the headers, and what the, re what, what the response should look like. And if all else fails, ask questions. Good API is going to have a forum, or they're going to have some way for you to interact with the people who are supporting the API. However, I can tell you that as the person on the other end, a lot of the time what happened was people would say, this broke. It's broken. And I didn't know what they were trying to do. I didn't know what they had, a, what they had, what their call was. I didn't know what they expected to happen. I only knew that something had happened that, that was unexpected. So in any API request or any support request, you want to always say, I did this exact thing. I expected this exact thing to occur. And to my dismay, I just want to put that in there because it's kind of funny and it makes them laugh and then, then, then they'll be more inclined to help you. Z, this, the other thing occurred instead. 
So to give you, and most people think, well, why do I need to tell you what I expect to occur? It's obvious. Okay, so, so I have my, my favorite example. I jumped off the cliff. I expected to sprout wings and fly. To my dismay, I plunged to my death instead. Okay, so there's not actually a bug in gravity. My understanding was incorrect. It was not correct. And as a, as a client, as a user, you need to realize that if your understanding of what the API does is incorrect, that's not a dig on you. It's probably a problem with the documentation. They should have set your expectations correctly. It's, it's perfectly valid to say, based on this thing I saw on your website, I expected this behavior and I got this instead. But give them all of the information that you have. Set the context correctly. Because what you don't want is a lot of iterations. You're frustrated. You want to get the answer and get your application up and running. So give them all that information so that they can help you right away. Because as a support person, I can tell you, I want to help you get past that speed bump. I don't want you to have to, have to stop and be frustrated. So preventing preventable problems. Okay, so if the first thing you really have to understand is you are relying on someone else's system. You can't make the assumption that it's gonna be stable or always work or, or anything. You, much, you have much less power and control and you can rely much less on them working all the time. So you need to really code defensively. As I said, you want to use existing libraries, existing code, find sample examples, example code that does similar to what you want to do, and, and start from there. Um, test defensively. Um, don't assume it's always going to work the same way every time. Their server might crash. Your client should handle that gracefully. Um, one of the things that's super useful um, for you to do is log errors that you get or log the transactions that you get because in, in a case like LinkedIn, they have millions of calls a day and when you say that something is broken, they can't go look it up. But if you have information about exactly what you sent and exactly what you got back, that'll help a lot in debugging what happened. And test frequently, always. <laughs> So um, that's my talk, and I will be happy to take questions and give chocolates. You don't even have to ask a question to get chocolates. I know it's been a long day, so, um, and I got a lot of chocolates over there at Godiva, so. Um, I am Sinedra on Twitter. I am happy to answer any questions that anybody has here after the talk, or send me a tweet. Uh, you can send an email to me at kirsten at threescale.net. Um, I am Princess Polymath, and uh, I will be at the API Strategy Conference in Amsterdam. Um, March 26th through the 28th. Uh, horrible life I have. I have to go off to Amsterdam. Um, so that's it. Any questions? <laughs>